Guys, I was talking to my son's aunt about why Ray Comfort sets up people really good for the gospel, but then drops the ball. He'll come up to you and, and, and see the law was given so the offense might abound, so that every mouth may be stopped, all become guilty before God, and ultimately to be a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. It's to show us our need for a Savior, to show us how we do fail and fall short of God's glory through the law. That's what it was given for. Now, at the time, it was given to Israel for their blessing or cursing of a nation on this earth. And they had the animal sacrifices and all that to fix the sin they, they were doing. But that was just covering it until the good thing came. That was a shadow, right? But ultimately, the law was given so the offense might abound and every mouth may be stopped and all become guilty. To show us our need for a savior. A lot of people look at the rich man's story and totally missed the mark there. So he told him to keep the commandments to be perfect. All right, anyway, so what he does is he'll make people guilty by the law, which is great. You say, hey, do you, I don't even think you need to do this, but if he's doing it that way, that's okay to come to people and say, hey, um, are you, do you think you're getting to heaven? Well, I think I'm a good person. Have you ever lied? Yeah. Have you ever uh, stole even anything? Yeah, you're a, you're a liar and a thief. Okay, it goes a little heavy with that, but all right. So we, he showed them how they fell by the law, right? They're primed. They're right. Well, uh, what, what can I do? I've failed God's standard. God's standard's perfection. If you want to work for salvation, standard's perfection. Look at Matthew 5, where he tells them, he really ups the standard. If you even have hatred in your heart, you are a murderer. I mean, he's just making it impossible. Why? If he wants to show them they need to turn to him. That they need to repent, to change their mind and stop trusting in their dead works. Let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. God grant true repentance to acknowledging of the truth. And it commands all men to repent of what? Their idolatry. It's about what you believe in. See? So uh, this is uh, a great way to set up someone to hear the good news. But does he do it? Nope. Nope. Instead, once they realize they're guilty... He'll say, instead of saying, there's the problem, but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. They're ready for it. Does he do it? No. It's the biggest letdown ever. They're primed. They're guilty. They're convicted. And now what's the solution? Repent of those sins. So keep the law that you just found out you can't keep. Stop lying. Stop stealing. Stop bearing false witness. Works of the law. And by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So he's preaching works of the law for salvation. Plus, repentance of sin is something the Holy Spirit does once you're saved, if you choose to follow the Spirit. Right? It's not something you do to qualify to come to Jesus. You don't have to get yourself well, because he died for sinners, not saints. Okay? He gives a gospel for saints. You got to be willing to stop all. It's not for him that willeth or for him that runneth, but of God who shows mercy. So this this is wrong. He drops the ball. So instead of saying, "See, you're guilty under the law. You can't do it. You need a savior." Trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus completely, because you're trusting in Him, in whom we trusted. We are the gospel of our salvation. We believe. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. How long? Till the day of redemption, when the body's redeemed. So the good news is that you trust in Christ. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that Christ died for his sins according to scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel that saved us, Paul said. That's it. Mocking his cheap grace all you want to, but it cost God his son. And you trample the son of God underfoot and call the blood of the covenant by which we're saved an unclean thing. And it, it's horrifying to me when they do that. So instead of that, he says, repent of your sins, stop your sins, keep the law. Oh yeah, and believe in Jesus. No, Jesus said in some sidebar, he's not a supplement for your righteousness. As Abraham believed God, it's counted to him for righteousness. We believe God. The report of his son, that he gives us eternal life and that life is in his son. That I tell you these things that believe on the name of the son of God, so you may know you have eternal life. You can know it. Why? Because you're trusting only in Christ, not in yourself. If it be of grace, it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it be of works, and it's not grace, because otherwise works no more work. What does that mean? You can't mix them. Because if you're trying to earn it, it's not grace anymore. It's some reward you think God owes you. And then if you uh, uh, try to bring grace into works, then it's not about your works anymore. It's grace and it can't mix. You're either earning it and trusting in what you do 
or you're resting in God's grace, relying on what Jesus did alone. He paid all your sins, all of them. Again, many Christians aren't even believers. They don't believe he purged our sins by himself. Sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. It was all done. It's a towel stop. Paid in full. It's finished. The, he paid my sin that he bought me with his own blood. I'm his. Nothing can change that. And when I trusted in him, I was born of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. See, that's the difference between the true faith and every false religion in the world, every false Christianity. I said before, the Catholic Church is the mother of harlots and all her little Protestant harlot daughters. Because they all add some kind of works to it. All of it. So, there's very few. The way is narrow, and Jesus is the way. The way is a person, not a process. The truth is a person. You know, it's all about Jesus. Trusting in him. I don't care if you can't get it. It's foolishness to them that don't believe, that are perishing. They don't get it. They can't. And it said, if our gospel be hid, it be hid to them that are lost. Satan's blind to them. So uh, that's what he does. Instead of, he primes them up for the gospel and then drops the ball and goes, okay, so now repent of those sins. Keep that law that you can't keep. <laughs> it has nothing to do with your performance. They don't know what the word repent means. Metanoia, metanoia means change your mind. You can repent of a sin. But it doesn't say that. It says repent. Now, unless it says what to repent towards or from, you assume it's just a change of mind. And you have to see the context of what it means. Peter preached to the Jews on Pentecost. And when he said repent and believe, do you think he meant y'all keep the law better, turn from your sins to 3,000 Jews that try very strictly to keep the law because they're there for Passover to offer the lamb. They're keeping the law the best. He's not talking about them not sinning. What happened there? He preaches to them and says, this same one you crucified, you called for his death. He is both Lord and Christ. <gasps> Men and brethren, what shall we do? They just found out they crucified the Lord of glory. What shall they do? Repent and believe. Change your mind from wanting him dead. Turn from your unbelief in who he is because he is both Lord and Christ. He rose again. Now put your trust in him. Repent and believe. Change your mind from not believing on him and believe on him. It's so clear. Please read it in the book of Acts. When Paul is preaching to the Athenians on Mars Hill, he says, hey, I see you got a statue. It says to the unknown God, this same unknown God, I'm preaching to you today. And he tells them about Jesus and what he did. And he says, I see all your idols. You're very superstitious. God winked at your ignorance, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. And people send that to me like it means to turn from sin. <laughs> no, what is he talking about? Trusting in idols. It's a belief issue. So he winked at your ignorance of you knew there was a God, but you didn't know who he was. So you made an idol and you bowed down to it because you didn't really know God. But I'm telling you who he is now. So you got to repent of trusting in those idols and turn to the living God in faith. You see, you have to read in context. So this is the issue here. They don't know what the word repent means. That's the main thing. Uh, and it's very clear in Jonah 3.10 that the Bible confirms that turning from sin, which is keeping the law, sin's transgression of the law, to repent of a sin is to keep that law. If I tell you I'm a liar and you say, uh, you've got to repent of lying. What have I just done? Do not bear false witness. It's a work of a law. I've just kept one of the laws, right? So, uh, and you can't mix it because... Uh, Christ is of no effect to you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You've fallen from grace. Okay, so this rich man comes. This is over in Luke 18. The rich man comes, said, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said, Why call me good? None's good. Save one. That's God. So he knew right there that God did not recognize him as the Son of God. He did not have faith in him. He knew he was some kind of prophet or master or something. But he didn't know. He didn't acknowledge him as divine. So he goes, okay, well, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal. And he lists them off. And he goes, hey, all these I've kept from my youth. Oh, really? You kept all the laws perfectly. Sent. And he goes on to explain, you know, in Matthew how nobody's kept it, you know. But in any case, uh, he tells him here, oh, okay, well, we'll keep the law. Let, let's see. He's going to prove right here that he didn't keep the first law, to love God with all your heart and to not put anything before him. And he loved his money. So he says, you know the commandments. Oh, all these I've done. And he goes, okay, yet lackest thou one thing. 
Sell all that thou hast and distribute it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was sorrowful, for he was very rich. Jesus just proved to him by the law that he didn't really keep the law. And what he should have done was turn to him and say, well, I'm not perfect, then I obviously fall short and become guilty because the law was given the offense might abound. And he say, oh, what can I do? And this is what the apostles do when the man leaves, okay? And Jesus goes on to explain, hey, it's harder for a camel to go through. The, it's easier for a camel to get out of the needle than for a rich man to get in the kingdom of God. And so Jews back then believed if you were wealthy, then you had God's blessing and you are a righteous person. If they can't be saved, then who, right? And so this guy claims to have kept all the commandments. And they're like, well, well who can be saved? Aha, you're right where you need to be. Well, who can be? This is impossible. It's impossible for me to earn salvation through my works. I fall short. Who can be saved? That's what the law should do to you. And in that aspect, Ray Comfort's doing it right. He's getting them to be guilty under the law, to prove they're not good like they think they are, according to God's standards, which is perfection. Okay? But he never gives them the ministry of reconciliation, that we've been reconciled to God through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son. And it's very sad. Because they're primed for the gospel and they need the gospel. They need to understand what he accomplished. He became sin for me and then gives me his righteousness. It's like a trade. He took my sin, became a curse, and then I get his righteousness and the blessing. As he is, so are we in the world. So when they ask, well, who can be saved? And good, because that's where you need to be. And Jesus responds... With man, it's impossible. Impossible. Do you hear that? With man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And that's where we need to get. And that's why I hate this false gospel message. That person is no longer, uh, no closer to heaven than they were before they talked to Ray Comfort. At all. They never trusted in Christ. They weren't sealed. They weren't born again. Now, what they're going to probably do, if they wanted, if they accept this ridiculous burden Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You lay a burden on them, then make them twice the son of hell as yourself. You block the kingdom. Put a burden on them that you yourself can't bear. So what what will happen is if they do decide to take on this impossible burden and deceive themselves into thinking they can repent of all their sins, then uh, they're going to become puffed up in pride, start getting working in the flesh to get rid of their bad habits and do the Christian thing and read the Bible and do all this good stuff, and then they're still lost, but they think they're saved because they believe in Jesus, supposedly, kind of. They believe he died for their sins. They don't realize he purged all their sins. It's all paid for. It's all what he did. He gets all the glory. If it was about what they were doing, then, you know, they could boast. I'm saved because I gave up my sin. I, I, I did it, and Jesus died for me. Jesus is like a side note to Ray Comfort. Oh, yeah, and believe in Jesus. That's the second thing. No, the, the whole, the problem is you, and you can't keep the law. You can't save yourself. You fall short. The Solution is Christ and what he did. He gets all the glory and he drops it, man. It just makes me crazy. So they'll get it. They'll start struggling in their flesh. They'll get puffed up in pride, start judging people, judging themselves. If they have a bad sin day, they'll start to question, am I really saved? Because they don't say, they don't, they don't put their foundation on Christ alone and God's promise that all who see the Son and believe on him shall never die. They don't, they don't believe that, that you've been perfected forever. You know, and that all your sins were purged, you'll remember them no more. You come boldly through the throne of grace. No, that they don't have any of that. They've got religion now. Same thing as every other false religion. They're going to try to be good to get to heaven. And it's not going to happen. You know, or they're going to reject it because they know it's impossible. And then never come to Jesus because they think in order to be saved, they've got to clean up their life first, and they're not ready to do that. No, you give them the gospel, let the Holy Spirit seal them, and he'll begin that work. You know, you can send them to someone to help disciple them, because they're saved. Now they need to choose whether they're going to be a disciple and serve the one that saved them. And you know, when you're eternally secure and you're trusting only in Christ, something does happen. You want to. You love him, and you do it out of love, and you're not self-absorbed anymore because you're taken care of. Now you can give other people the gift, you know? So anyway, I want to show you why uh, he, he, he's, he can't save anybody. He just can't. I'm not speaking against the man. He's very charming. I'm sure he's a good person. 
I, it's just he drops the ball. He preaches another gospel. I don't hate the man. I won't say anything about his character. It's just what he preaches. When it says mark and avoid them, it doesn't mean mark them personally and start exposing them personally. No, expose the doctrine. That's all. You know, so anyway, I want to show why that's a huge deal. It's a difference between heaven and hell. All right, guys. God bless you.